Hey, it's George, and welcome to the Call to Adventure podcast. We're on a mission to help create happier people and a healthier planet. So let's get after it. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Call to Adventure podcast with me, the founder of Call to Adventure, George Beasley, and my co-host for today, Adam Hugill. Hello there. So today we're doing something completely different. As opposed to a chat digging into an adventure or activist's life, this is an in-between episode where we'll answer a question or give advice on a topic. Today's is bikepacking and cycle touring, hard-earned tips from thousands of miles on and off the road. Some are very tactical and specific, and others are overarching tidbits of advice and a couple of funny bonus tips here and there, so stick around to the end for those bad boys. But before we get cracking, a quick trip reminder... There's still some space on the Welsh 3000s trip, which is an epic weekend summiting 15 of the highest peaks in Wales, including the infamous Crib Goch, which is an awesome peak if you haven't done it. We've also put on an extra date for the Make Me a Mountaineer course in the Pyrenees, where you'll learn everything you need to know about mountaineering from a world-class Everest guide. I'm going on that one, so check out if we've still got some spaces by the time you hear this. As with all of our trips now, if you book on but the trip can't go ahead due to COVID, you'll be offered to change to a later date, move to a different trip, or get a full refund, no questions asked. So head over to calltoadventure.uk if you're keen on joining us on those or any other adventures. But now back on to bikepacking and cycle touring tips. Some of you who have listened to the pod for a while know that I biked mainly off-road from Alaska to Panama over 18 months. We did a few other bits and bobs along the way to change things up like a 16-day canoe in the Yukon, some hiking here and there and we actually hired an RV for a couple of weeks whilst my girlfriend was sick. But I've spent a long time traveling by bike and have done loads of smaller trips here and there too. So I'm keen to share what I've learned. Adam, can you give a bit of background to you and your cycle touring experience? My bike touring uh, history really started about six years ago, like 2014. I did a few short tours in in Europe and uh, in the UK, like nothing longer than two weeks. And then the biggest bike tour I've been on to date. Uh, started in the summer of 2018, where I cycled from Southeast Asia through China and South Korea, Japan, and then cycled from very similar to yourself from the top of Alaska down through Canada, the United States. And I decided to call my journey to an end there at about 20,000 kilometers and return back to the UK just before everything went a bit strange with COVID. And uh, <laughs> yeah, then I've, so now I've been back in the UK now for nine months and still getting out on the bike. I'm getting much more into bike packing. Now I've got a mountain bike and I really dislike being near traffic, really. I think be getting out into the, uh, the remote areas is, is what I'm looking for. Awesome. We've got a few tips and uh, we'll run through them. So Adam, why don't you kick us off with tip number one? Yeah, tip number one. Often people will go on a really big bike trip as the very first thing they'll ever do and then probably hate it, especially if you start super big. So I would always say start small, local to yourself. Um, bike touring or bike packing is is really just intended to, to get out there and enjoy nature and do it in a really enjoyable, fun way. So if your first ever trip something big, there's, there's a lot of lessons that will be learned the hard way. Whereas if you start small, I think you'll you'll learn a lot of lessons that will, when you choose, and if you choose to go into bigger journeys, you'll carry on through there. Yeah, I think it can make it a lot more enjoyable. It's interesting because you did start small and we did, well, Alaska to Panama was our first bit of bikepacking and cycle touring. And I could definitely see how doing a few smaller trips would have been good. We had a whole palaver beforehand with bikes not being delivered and all that kind of jazz. So our bikes arrived two days before we left. So we didn't really have the opportunity to do much training beforehand. But my girlfriend didn't enjoy it so much right at the start because it was a bit of a trial by fire and lots of things went wrong. And I ended up in hospital after two days with inflammation in my knees from knee injuries. 
So then we ended up, I think we only cycled for three, two or three days. And then we had to stay at this lady's house who we met along the way for two weeks. And fortunately, she was great, but we just played cards and didn't cycle anywhere because I was having steroid injections in my knees. And that that was like a really good example of if I'd have done some smaller trips, I would have known that my knees couldn't handle that many days. And then I could have built up to doing a bit bigger distance instead of try thinking, oh, well, you know, 50, 60 K doesn't sound that big a day. But with all the weight on your bike going uphill into wind, it certainly was for me. So I, I think start small is definitely a goodie. There's so many lessons there, which you've you've pulled out from your first, first ever bike tour. And there's probably so many sub tangents there when you talk about your bikes only arriving two days before so did you say you you ordered them online and then received them the first time you saw it in person was when they arrived is that is that what happened yeah because we got them from poland so they were on a partial sponsorship right which is why we ended up doing that i can certainly see why you wouldn't do that i guess that's where you were going to go with it yeah, I, I like whenever people ask me what bike should I get to do a first bike trip. Usually, like the first thing I'll say is, well, what bike do you currently have? And if they have a bike to start with, I'd say use that bike because it's a bike you already have in, and it's the cheapest bike. And usually, you'll find out if that bike works or not, and if you want to spend a lot of money. And the second bit of advice, if they don't have one, would be is to get a bike that fits correctly. Rather than brands or what metal are you going to use, steel or aluminium, I think like sizing is so important. It's hard to know for sure until you really sit on one and start moving with the bike. I suppose a bike shop can help a lot with that. Definitely. So start small, a few test rides first. Ideally, take all your kit out first and get familiar with it. So I remember we were trying to figure out how to use the MSR cooker whilst we were there on like the first day and that was an absolute nightmare <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't figure this thing out i, I didn't realize that you had to prime it and yeah. uh, i was like you know i'll just watch a youtube video but we had no signal in the middle of like rural alaska so yeah. uh so i was just trying to figure this thing out and it's it kind of always makes for fun stories afterwards but uh if you want a smoother more enjoyable time then then a bit of prep goes a long way and it also i think a big part of it is that it gets you excited about it before you go like it makes it the build up is part of the reward like the looking forward to it and the doing little bits here and there and then imagining yourself out on the trail in the future like using all of your kit and cycling on your bike i think that's that's like a big part of the the joy of it all oh it's huge and i think you're always changing what you're going to be packing and what you're going to take and i suppose whenever you write a kit list and you start packing all your gear that's going to change almost certainly and by doing smaller tours right if you're going to do a big tour overseas it's going to be quite expensive to ship gear back and forth or, or stuff like that so doing a small tour where you live i think there's so many positives that can come from it and i, I think seeing where you where you live through different eyes is also a huge part of the start small like like seeing where your own back roads and maybe streets and areas you've never been to you'll you'll get a new a new appreciation of for where you live i think yeah definitely right tip two get off the road or at least the big roads whenever you can so you kind of hinted at it before as you've moved into bike packing like away from cycle touring and um we had mountain bikes and kind of went for a hybrid setup. So bike packing very lightweight, like ultra light for 18 months is not that practical. Ideally, you want to be on something a couple of months, two or three is kind of doable, ultra light. But for a year and a half, it's quite a long time to not really have any comforts with you. So we had uh, panniers on the back but then uh, a roll bag on the front and a frame bag. So it was, it, uh, and then mount, mountain bikes, 29ers. It was Cross Bikes, by the way, who sponsored us. I should, I should give them a shout out. So that allowed us to go off road whenever we wanted. And obviously you can stay on the road, but um, cycling through really busy places like Mexico City on the really dangerous roads with 18 wheelers everywhere and it's kind of smelly and polluted, that certainly was some of the least enjoyable times for our trip. And I'm not a road biker. Some people love that kind of stuff. So I think cycling on the road can still be good, especially if you find little back roads. But uh, if you have the opportunity to get off the road, I think that's where most people will find the most fun and, and enjoy riding because then you're actually out in nature and feels much more adventurous. 
like the Great Divide mountain bike route and the Baja Divide were two of the highlights of our trip for riding. The Baja is just amazing. You can get super remote through parts of it, days cycle away from the nearest town and um, camping under the stars. And it really feels like what I wanted on a, on a bikepacking adventure, whereas we would have to often take roads to connect the trails. And um, yeah, with drunk drivers and people who don't have driver's licenses and just being very busy, it's a very different experience. Experience. So sometimes it can be good like to, to take small back roads, like when I did from Paris down to Toulouse when I was headed down to the Pyrenees. That was amazing. I was on the road for most of that, but they were really tiny little roads that nobody was on. And it was still beautiful and felt fairly remote. So uh, my advice would just be get off the road when you can, give it a go, even if it's just gravel, it doesn't have to be full trails. But uh, I think most people would, would really enjoy that if they gave it a chance. Something that often stops people getting off the roads is navigating. Most people will use uh, their phone, and uh, I've got my own answers to this. But it'd be interesting to know what you, how would you navigate off road, and what tools you'd use to find these off road routes. Just map and compass and stars. Follow my nose. Yeah, um, keep the sea on the right. No, we used a bit of a mixed setup. So I had a Garmin, I think an Oregon 850 that was amazing. And that had m maps downloaded to it that were really, really detailed. And you can get them from, for free from open street maps. Um, I think there's something in my bikepacking article about how to get them for free. But if not, just Google how to get biking maps for free and stick that on your GPS. And the GPS was great. But uh, it's also good to have a couple of backups, and sometimes it didn't get it quite right. So we also had the phone as as a kind of backup, and I used Gaia, Gaia GPS, and occasionally View Ranger. I think Gaia GPS is is my favorite, but I know loads of people use View Ranger. Yeah, View Ranger is great. I use that for like OS maps. Yeah, OS maps for the UK. But you really realize how lucky we are with good maps in the UK when you go somewhere like. Guatemala yeah. and that they'll sell you a map but there's not really anything on it there's just like a few high points here and there well loads of those but for the kind of ins and out of proper navigating Gaia was definitely useful and then um, plotting stuff on the on the Garmin how about you I used my phone I didn't have a GPS um, as as you did so my phone was my GPS in a way like that um so i would use maps.me for when navigating on roads but often and again it's an open street mapping app is maps.me free and you can download all the tiles for free which is brilliant but there's not a lot of detail often though no, there's no um topographical detail so you don't know where you're going to be climbing or not which often can be quite uh, a bit of a shock when you do, <laughs> take a side road and it, yeah um it can be, go wrong but uh google maps can be great and um, satellite view for google maps um people don't know this within the uk i don't think a lot but bing maps that very well-known search engine bing and um, b-i-n-g they have os maps for free as a layer on a desktop so if you ever want to access unlimited os mapping as of 2020 i don't know if that'll be there forever but that's brilliant to use again in the uk but there's so many other websites out there with dedicated routes which are dedicated off-road routes and the website which i think is probably one of the best resources for bikepacking is bikepacking.com mm. it's got so many great photographs and routes which have been up there by users and i think in the uk there's i don't know exactly how many but maybe between 10 and 15 different bikepacking routes i know in the us there's loads and most countries now are starting to have their own bikepacking dedicated routes, which uh, can be a great starting point before you start venturing off and making your own routes up. Definitely. Bikepacking.com is amazing. We use that a lot. And for when we're on established routes, I just downloaded the GPX, which is the type of file that the GPS reads, or it can be read by quite a few apps on your phone as well. So we had that and then sometimes use Trail Finders, which is another app 
to read the download from there. So for all of the Great Divide mountain bike route and the Baja Divide, Baja Divide's about 1,700 kilometers and the Great Divide mountain bike is even even longer. And yeah, we just followed the followed the route for that. So you just stick it on your on your phone or your sat nav and then it's easy breezy. And that was a that was a decent amount of mileage just between those two routes and a few others here and there. So yeah, that's a really good tip, Adam. And uh, it's the same in the UK. I, I did the same with the GPX files for maps.me and just like only five miles from where I live in Yorkshire in England, I ended up on the Pennine Bridleway and I'm now discovering all these old horse tracks which were used for, for being used for the last few hundred years and I'm like seeing where I live in a whole different way and discovering history in a way that Oh, this would have been a main road maybe 400 years ago, and now it's a it's overgrown bridleway, which is another really good way to kind of discover where you live. Hit us with tip three. What have you got? So tip three, we've talked a lot there about some bits of gear already, and my tip would be just don't get caught up in the gear trap. Too many people end up talking a lot about what type of tent do I need, what bite do I need, what other expensive bits of kit do I need. And you can spend literally thousands of pounds or dollars on gear and it will make your life sometimes a bit easier. But I really do think that usually the best bit of gear is either is the gear you've got. And there's something about getting some cheap gear secondhand, either from a Craigslist or from Facebook Marketplace or eBay. And sometimes if you get lucky and manage to find a deal, but getting some cheap bit of gear that lasts you a long time can really make you feel like you've, you've got really good value out of something. So I wouldn't get too caught up on what gear you've got. And it's also good environmentally as well. That stuff's already been produced. Then you're not buying new things that require new resources. So buying secondhand is really good. COVID, I think some people are a bit more worried about it now, but you can definitely still do it. And um, I'm a member of a few of the forums for bikepacking and wild camping. And my goodness, there's the uh, people who are just so into gear. And I get it. Like that's that's their thing. Like some people are into cars or or whatever. The, they are into gear, bike packing gear or, or ultralight camping gear, hiking gear. I think some people use it as a bit of excuse to not get started or maybe not consciously, but uh, if there's something holding them back from, say, their first wild camp or their first tour, then they'll justify not going because they don't have all of this expensive gear or fancy new stuff. And like you said, there's a time and a place for it. And if you're doing something particularly hardcore or dangerous, then you probably should at least have the right safety stuff for it. Bikepacking doesn't really matter so much. If you go climbing or mountaineering, then you probably don't want to scrimp on your quick draws or on your ice axe or on your cramp but for bike packing, you're basically just sitting on your bike and going camping, sleeping outdoors. So pretty much anything will, will get you through. Having said that, I'm also not one of those people who is uh, completely against buying outdoor gear or even more expensive gear. We have a, a Hilleberg tent and it's horrendously expensive. But uh, a good way that I've been thinking about outdoor gear is not, and kind of clothing more generally, is the cost per use as opposed to the absolute cost. Because fast fashion has trained us to think that a pair of jeans could cost eight or nine quid or a t-shirt should cost four quid. And um, there's just so many problems with that. And so uh, I'm happy to pay a bit more for something as long as it's well built. It has like minimal environmental cost and the supply chain is all done in an ethical way. People are being paid how much they should do at each stage and ultimately that it's going to last and not end up on a, in a landfill in, after a few uses. So the cost per use, whilst the tent was whatever, 700 quid, if you sleep in it 500 times, then it would probably slept in it. Yeah, more than that, probably 700 times, maybe even more. A pound per use is not bad at all. That's brilliant. Yeah, that cost per use is is really interesting to look at it in that way and per miles as well and when you're using a piece of gear that's gonna get you further or it's gonna wear down eventually like for one of the best examples of my best bargain was was a rear wheel that i broke in china i had a strong wheel to start with that the the surly dish trucker i was riding came with and in china the roads were actually the roads are quite good but i think it was the weight that caused the the rear wheel to crack i managed to get a replacement wheel in China and it cost me a, t of a total of five pounds 
equivalent. So, <laughs> and the guy, when the, I asked the guy, the, I only knew maybe about 10 different words in Chinese, like terrible Chinese, and h- how much uh, it was Dou Shao Chen. And I asked him how much, <laughs> and he answered me, uh, Wo Shi Kwai, which I'm definitely murdering that, which means 50 Kwai. And I was like, 50? That's like, that's nothing. That rear wheel lasted me for so long. I think I got about 10, 15,000 kilometers, but I could have done when I was in Alaska with a a new wheel that was strong because that wheel broke in the worst possible place. So there is definitely an argument for buying good quality gear. But I think my, my, my real tip and point is, is whatever gear you've got will do the job to start with. And as you get more into it, then you can really look at starting to buy gear. It's like, it's like if you're into any hobby, buying the most expensive gear to start with will probably not really be that valued or appreciated it's really when you start putting miles and distance into that gear okay tip four take more time to cover less distance when we were doing alaska to what was planned to be argentina we planned to do it in 18 months and that seems like a really long time like a year and a half of riding your bike that seems outrageously long but uh we only ended up getting to panama and then um yeah, my girlfriend fell off a bike, injured her knee, needed knee surgery, and then we ran out of travel insurance. So we ended up coming back. But that felt almost rushed, even just getting to there. I wouldn't say rushed, but we certainly wouldn't have liked to have done it any quicker. Some people are into just smashing out the miles and like they they just love looking at their Strava and just being like, I've done so many miles today. And that that for them is the reward. But I think for most people, it's more about the experience and the adventure. And uh, a big part for me was embracing not being busy because um, in our normal Western lives, to go from like a normal job where you have a lot of responsibility and loads of work and life is just so hectic, one of the best parts about being on a bikepacking or cycle touring trip, even if it's just a short one, is that you're not inundated with stuff that you have to do. So just giving yourself enough time to not feel like you're always rushed was for me certainly one of the big rewards. And the other part is the longer time you have or give yourself, the more time you have for serendipity. So so there were countless times when something amazing and unexpected came up. But one that springs to mind is we were trying to, we, when we'd finished the Baja Divide and we were at the bottom of the Baja Peninsula in La Paz, trying to get a boat over to the mainland, we spent, I think, a week or two there and couldn't find anyone. And then we met this guy and he was just like, "Ah, oh, I can't help you go there but you can just come on my boat for a week and we're going north so the way that you've just come but you can come for free and it's going to be great and we had an amazing time so we just left the bikes there and jumped on his boat and then went free diving and um, one of the guys was an instructor so we taught us a bit of free diving did some spear fishing and ate this amazing tuna and uh, incredible fish that the guys had like spear fished and then the dude who owned the ship was a chef sushi chef so he just busted that out 10 minutes after coming out of the water and it was absolutely phenomenal. So some of the best times that we had were not planned. And I think most people I talk to say exactly the same thing. Stumbling upon something random, giving yourself that extra time is one of the most rewarding parts of the journey. Did you find that? Exactly that. Yeah. We're really lucky that we both had 18 months or possibly longer on our journeys. And we f- I still feel like mine wasn't that long either. Like 18 months flew by. But some people might only have a week or two weeks to go on their trips. So if you had a week, I think what you're probably saying there is, is if you have an aim to, I don't know, let's say if you've got two weeks and your aim is to cycle the, the length of the United Kingdom, that could be great and amazing. But if it was me, I'd probably spend two weeks doing half that or even less. But I think that's because <laughs> I like to rest and stop at <laughs> afternoon, <laughs> afternoon snoozes. And, and when you talk about the freedom to do those things that you, you haven't planned, if you're on a tight schedule, and you've got to cycle, you're like, right, we have to do 70 miles today, and yet, or 100 miles today. And you are really just, t- like, I think, almost doing, ticking it off by numbers. Mm. You might feel a sense of achievement at the end. And if that is a name and you have set yourself that for, that, that can be really rewarding. And it really depends before you start what is the aim of your journey? Is it to have fun? 
to enjoy yourselves, to to build yourself as a person, or is it to achieve a tangible goal of cycling from A to B? And I think me and you fit more in that traveler category rather than we're going to go out and break the land speed record. Absolutely. Really well put. So hit us with tip number five. Tip number five. And this is something that you get told not to do when you're younger, which I think it makes sense, but but it's talking to strangers. Like, oh, if I didn't talk to strangers on the journey, it'd be a very lonely journey when I was biking by myself through even countries like Japan or South Korea, where I understand hard none of the language, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and uh, yes, the, the interactions I had with people, if you either speak their language or if you don't, um, they make your day. Like Again, so many instances, and there can be so many little things that somebody can offer you, be it a smile, be it a piece of food, a place to sleep, and these real basic human needs that a stranger can just offer you. It really, I, I, I fully believe that 99% of the world has is good people that want to provide for their families. And it's not just a belief. It's like, I think I've witnessed it and seen it and for sure there are truly bad people in this world but i'm really fortunate that i've not stumbled across many of them so talk to strangers and and especially accept help it's really hard to accept i found it really hard to accept help because i'm this very independently headed person that thinks i can do everything and then sometimes you get stuck and you're like what am i gonna do and just putting your hand up sometimes and thumbing a lift. I, I had to do that. I had to do that. I've done had to do that a couple of times. I had to do that most recently in the in England. And that was when um my rear um mech hanger, which is a piece of metal that keeps your rear derailleur attached to your your bike snapped and it was during covid at that times and there was no ability to get a replacement and the guy who was happened to have a bike rack on the back of his car drove past me and offered to give me a lift to the nearest train station and if i had have just been like no it's okay i wouldn't have had a really wonderful interaction with the stranger but yeah or talk to strangers have you had any good experiences of talking to strangers george where do we even start but yeah lots of lifts that were needed when i was sick or kubi was sick and um yeah i had very much the same experience and 99 percent of people are just really nice and cool and there's it's only a few bad apples one of the best things is the change in perspective and that faith in humanity that's brought back but what one that sticks out is actually probably because we were just talking about it before when we left anchorage we literally stayed at this bloke's house and then the next day packed everything started cycling and we'd probably gone 50 meters and i was like really pumped first day of the bike tour we're on our way to argentina and um this american couple were standing there uh, and you and you've got all of your all of your stuff on your bike so you're obviously doing something with your panniers on and uh, this lady just said oh where where are y'all off to and uh, we said argentina like super excited and, <laughs> and full of it and she was like no way and we said yeah so um she was like oh can we buy you breakfast we'd love to have a chat about that that sounds great they were kind of 50 50 something 60 something and we thought, oh, I really, I really want to get going, but um, but they were so excited, and uh, and so we said, yeah, yeah, okay, let's go. They said, yeah, there's there's a cafe just around the corner, so we ended up going and having having breakfast with them, and they were really, really kind, good people. Bought some coffee and and some brekkie, and this this lady said just before we went, she was like, oh, uh, I've got a friend called Karen up in Willow, and if you if you need anything, just give her a ring. Her kids are bikers, and they always have people staying at the house. There's this lady she's 70 something she lives by herself but she's super friendly so, and i said oh well we're not really going that way but thanks anyway and she said no 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 just just take the number just in case so uh we ended up taking the number and then yeah it was two days later we ended up changing our route because my knees were inflamed and i couldn't cycle anymore and uh where did we happen to stop just next to willow alaska so um i gave this lady a ring I said, hi, Karen. My name's George. I met some people who I can't remember the name of in a Starbucks two days ago. They said maybe we could come and 
stay at your house? And she said, yeah, that sounds great. Just just come on over. So she was absolutely amazing, like to have a call out of the blue like that. And we ended up staying, yeah, for, for a week or so. We kind of um, just played cards every day and uh, and drank sitting out on the porch with the American flag draped over. It was it was amazing. It was really, really fun. I, I called them uh, road angels. Yeah. People that came up to me on the road and just imparted like, wisdom or a bit of food or like just just some guidance and i'm like you like where have you come from like yeah. middle of nowhere it's so good it, it is really amazing okay tip six something a bit different this one was just a very practical one very tactical says that we've got some of those in there too so mine is take a water filter like the soya mini filter and a water bladder so you avoid buying and throwing away loads of plastic bottles we ended up taking one anyway we we wanted to take a water filter because often take it out when we're just kind of backpacking or that kind of thing and knew that we wanted to get as remote as possible so obviously you need water but there's loads of water out in creeks and that kind of thing but you need to filter it so we just had it with us anyway and then we'd seen loads of people buying all this um, plastic bottled water along the way and then just kind of throwing it away and I just really loved the feeling of filtering water and just knowing that we weren't creating any more trash. And then also, yeah, it allowed us to go really remote and then not have to worry about not having water. One big tip is to keep the plunger that comes with it because after you use Essential. It, oh, Essential. yeah. You, lo- yes. you lose that thing. God, that was an absolute... We lost it somewhere and I thought, oh, we probably won't need that. But the, with all the, of the... The backwash. Yeah, yeah. All the sediment that goes through it and all of the stuff that you have to filter out it becomes unusable after a couple of weeks so keep protect that plunger with your life and yeah we saved money didn't buy as many bottles and got to go really remote so uh yeah highly recommended did you use one of those i used that exact same filter the soya mini and that little plunger thing was worth its weight in gold sometimes when i was because it can take quite a long time to filter with a soya mini there's um there's a few other soyas that are a bit more expensive that have a quicker flow rate but uh i've recently started using a steri pen which mm. um which my girlfriend had happened to have one so i've not had to buy it she she used that and she also went on a 14 month long bike trip through uh, like central asia and uh, from the uk and she swears by a steri pen and it's always something i never have used and hers uses batteries because it's an older model but now they make them where you charge it via usb and mm. um, they're ex- they're expensive i think they're about 100 pounds so compared to the mini soya which is a lot cheaper i think that's probably more like 20 pounds but um yeah i i really prided myself on not ever buying water being like i'm never buying water and um unless my water bottle that i was using because i used just a kind of the just what are meant to be single use plastic water bottles but a 1.5 liter bottle i'd buy one of them and i'd make it last six months <laughs> and i would like use it until it was like at oh it, i had a cambodian water bottle in america which i'd used all this time <laughs> and i used to squeeze the bottle um, cause uh, rather than, you know, the soya filters come with a bag, yeah. which you can fold up. So I, my bag had broke quite early on and the thread on these Cambodian water bottles just happened to fit the thread on the soya filter. And it was quite a cheap plastic that was quite squeezable. So I could squeeze a liter and a half through it in one go, but that meant it weakened it and it, yeah when that broke i think out of all the gear which i became attached to that water bottle was was the most attached to a piece <laughs> of kit like uh, like probably not cost less than 10 pence for oh because of the, the memories <laughs> that thing would get me alive <laughs> but it's yeah it sounds a bit ridiculous but but yeah i remember that that going and having to to discard it and being like oh no <laughs> the bottle <laughs> the bottle is gone but yeah but the, the, like, and also it uh, links into another point is if you want to get water, you're usually going to have to talk to a stranger. Hmm. So if like you're in, again, say Cambodia, the middle of, of, of a rural area and you want some water and there's no rivers or there's no streams, you're going to have to go up to somebody and say, is it okay if I have some water? And, and these people genuinely would love 
the fact you've come over to talk and we'd pour you some water and give you a bottle and off you and you'd have a really good conversation and often it would end up leading to them probably making you making a cup of tea and you'll have a, some tea together some chai and you'd have this like another good experience just because you went and asked for some water so there's so many knock-ons that can be positive from from not buying water yeah what about number seven Number seven. So I think this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently myself, and it's definitely something that stuck with me on the, my own bike trip. But tip seven is to bike your own bike ride. There's a, a, a saying, I don't know where I heard this, but it's um, comparison is the thief of joy. And to compare yourself to somebody else or to anybody else doesn't make you happy. And I think quite a lot of the time you'll see either on social media or in real life, you'll meet other bike touring people. And you can often find yourself comparing yourself, either your gear, either how far they're cycling, or if you're looking through social media, you might see somebody doing something amazing, is to not really worry about what other people are doing and really focus on yourself, ride your bicycle in your way. And in a way that makes you happy, like I've got friends that carry an, an like an extortionate amount of gear. Like they carry camping chairs, they carry all their clothes that they would want to carry, like and um, be it a smart pair, a casual pair, and they will get criticised by people sometimes for for carrying too much gear. But the people, this this person I'm thinking of, will be like, no, I'm happy, and he bikes his own ride. And then there'll be other people that want to go do world records and go super fast. And other people will criticize them to say, oh, you need to stop and enjoy yourself. And, he, and they could be like, no, I'm, I mean, I want to go really fast. So do what you want to do and don't worry about anybody else. Mm, I think that's probably the most important of all of them. And I completely echo all of that. Nobody really gives a shit that you're doing it. Do it for you. And unless you're breaking a record, then then you obviously do need to bike every bit of the trail. But uh, it's so easy. It's kind of like this little microcosm of um, people almost competing to like who's got the lightest bike. And the amount of times that people said exactly what you said then, oh, they've got way too much weight on their bike. And, it, and it's just like they they have as much weight as they want on there. And they'll soon realize if they don't want all that stuff, then they'll take it off. But there's no right amount to have or right way to do it. And um, I think we, we talked about this once before when we'd seen each other, maybe up in Scotland or something about I felt really bad when we had to get our first ride. Uh, oh, man. I, 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 same. Kubi, my girlfriend, was ill. And she she was she had H. pylori, a bacterial infection in the stomach, and she was like bent over on a bike in rural Montana. And I was pulling her with an orange cord off road back to the road, and I was just grinding it out. And uh, we we got to the road, and I was like, oh, looking how far it was. Oh, another twenty k to the hospital. We'll be there soon. And she was just like, let's just let's just get a ride. And I uh, and I was just like, no, 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 no. Then then we won't have cycled it all. And uh, and then she was just kind of getting really, she was just like, who gives a shit? And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, guess, I guess who who does give a shit? And then we put, our, put the thumb out. There was also not many people around, but fortunately put the thumb out. The next lady who drove past had a big old truck, drove us to hospital. And like, it doesn't have to be anything that extreme either, but that really helped me to realize like, do whatever you want to do don't care what other people are doing and don't don't judge yourself against them and you're you that that quote's really good comparison is the thief of joy i think that's a very pithy way to sum it up i think you and i have both been inspired to travel and to go on bike tours by people like alistair humphreys and sean conway who you've previously interviewed and other people that we kind of see have done these amazing things and i find myself comparing myself to them and I know that their answer would be, don't. They would say don't. They'd be like, do your own thing. Like It's not about the things they've done. But I know that they've probably been in the same trap where they have either continued on with something because of some rule that they've set themselves. And I think there's this t like toughness of being an adventurer that we think that, you, particularly on a bike, that like, oh, I, I have to cycle all of the way and never take a lift. But for me, it was, there was exact similar circumstance. I took a lift for the first time after about 
I'd been, I was halfway through Canada and it was to go, it was very different circumstances. It was to go to a music festival. <laughs> it was the, the offer of have been by myself cycling through Canada for, by that point for weeks. And I just wanted company. I'd wanted to be with people. It was on the island of Haida Gwaii, which is on the west coast of Canada. Oh, this really, spe- really special place, which um, I'd been advised to go there a couple of times and didn't think I'd be able to make it. And I met somebody uh, who was happened to be driving to this festival and she'd broken down and I happened to be camping at this library where she was trying to get a breakout breakdown service and she got back vehicle was working and then she's like well i'm going to this festival and would you like to come with me and i chose to go and that decision changed my journey it changed everything in my head it was all about I cycle as much as I want to. And I cycled a lot. Like after that, I didn't take another journey until after Death Valley in California. And after I'd cycled that, I took a, um, a small ride to the edge of Las Vegas from the edge of Death Valley just to cut a day out because, because I again wanted to go to Death Valley. But the <laughs> reason you, the reason you take that ride, um, has so many different reasons, but I think setting yourself rules and being strict and rigid on it can sometimes lead to you not enjoying it. And it's kind of work out what's the point. And that was the growth for me on my journey. And it sounds like it, for you, it happened early, early days rather than um, for me, it was like 10 months in. Yeah, there's like the maturity stages of the cycle tourist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. And you, you'll you still meet people that will be... So I, 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 oh, I got made to go in the back of a, a vehicle where there was roadworks in Alaska, I think it was. Oh no, it's Canada, Northern Canada and Yukon. Made to go in the vehicle. And they do this often when there's big lot stretches of roadworks for safety and also because there's a lot of trucks so the bike isn't on a single lane with these trucks and um as i got into the vehicle i was actually quite glad <laughs> that i didn't have to go next to this freshly laid tarmac and the woman i asked her um does she see many other cyclists and she said yes uh, i once had one guy who insisted on spinning his back wheel the whole way <laughs> as if he was still cycling it like so to go in the back of the truck and span the wheel and i was like what an idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I just, but he had his reasons and I'm sure it's, it's wrong of me to judge him as well. But uh, yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> so tip number eight. Tip number eight. So use warm showers. Um, so a lot of people, if they've already done a bike tour, and even if you haven't, um, will know about warm showers. But it's basically a website or app and app uh, to find people to stay with for free. So it's like couch surfing but for cycle tourists. And um, there's there's a number of reasons why it's amazing. Um, it not only obviously saves you cash, but uh, you get to meet awesome people who are hosts and often not cycle tourists themselves. So some, a lot of times they are, but sometimes they just like meeting the, the weirdos who come through on bikes. And, uh, and it just builds this amazing sense of community. And, and it's very nice to connect with other people who have been on the road, other bike travelers or cycle tourists who realize what it's like to be in your position where you've just been on the road for months and you're feeling absolutely knackered. And then you you kind of feel like you have to make an effort for people, but you just feel completely empty and exhausted and people are often doing it on a shoestring. So it's good to be able to connect with people, other people who are staying at their house too. And like we touched on before, the kind of kindness of strangers and people that don't owe you anything, but want to do such nice things for you, like cooking amazing food or just um, uh, having a kind of open invite in their house. A couple of shout outs. So there's a lady called Tuli Arce in uh, in Baja, and she just has so many people. There's always about six or seven tents uh, in her driveway and then people staying in the house. And she was amazing. We stayed there for about a week and met all these weird and wonderful people. And she does a few tours, but she just loves having people there. And uh, and I think that's an amazing way to live live your life and be so kind to others. And there's another lady, unfortunately, I can't remember her name, but people will know who she is if you've done the Great Divide mountain bike route. She's kind of famous. She has these cabins and cooks amazing food every day and just has thousands of cycle tourists uh, or bike packers through uh, each year. So yeah, somebody can remind me of her name, but she was amazing. So use warm showers, even if you don't need to save the cash 
or you like the idea of wild camping all the way, at least give it a go for a couple of nights because it's uh, it's such a rewarding experience. I would completely agree. Warm showers is better in some countries than others, for sure. Um, the US, it's brilliant. Uh, a lot of Europe, it's brilliant. In a lot of Southeast Asia, it can be quite sporadic, just the amount of people that are on it. Mm. But when you do find somebody on it, it's an, abs- it's an absolute gem, usually. So I, I'd highly recommend it. And I, I would also add for myself, I, I think I used it really less so, I think, for free accommodation and more for that community aspect. The, the long, the long, like initially when I first started, I thought, oh, great, you get to stay for free. This will save me money. And then later, I realized what you're giving these people is your time, your stories, and your energy. And you've got to really go into a warm showers environment with that, like to go in there like you're ready to host. And some people, you'll arrive and they may have other plans. I've, I've, I've been to a couple, there's a warm showers in uh, Thailand where the guy has a beach hut. And he gives you the code to the beach hut and it's literally on the beach in a town called Bankrut. And uh, just you've got the whole beach hut to yourself. And uh, I did happen to meet the person that owned this by pure coincidence and on two occasions but and so i did get to say thank you but often you sometimes you don't get to meet them in that circumstance but usually you'll meet the person and and really make friendships and so we i reckon so many of our stories are and memories and connections are from warm showers without that website we'd have completely different experiences on our bike trip. A hundred percent. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Some of them were just phenomenal as well. Like we stayed in uh, some that needed a little lick of paint, but it's it's again, it's exactly like you say, it's the it's the human connection. And yeah, you you do in a way owe them your kind of presence and your time for them hosting you. But one of them we stayed in, I was just outside Yellowstone National Park in, I think we were in Montana or maybe just one state south. I'm not sure if we were coming from the north or the south to Yellowstone, but my God, it was called the Man Cave and it was huge. This guy didn't, he he had his proper house somewhere else, the guy who owns it. And this was just where he went out and stored all of his toys. And there were skidoos there, giant bison head on the wall, which was a little bit weird, but it was just massive and uh, and a couple of stories. And he was just like, yeah, just, just go and stay as long as you want. I've not got anybody coming. Just stay as long as you want. The code's this. And we rocked up. We were traveling with, an, with two other people who were very interesting. I'll have to tell a story about them another time, two stand-up comedians <laughs> who were, I'm not, I'm not even going to to go into it now but that was probably they, they were some of the most interesting people i've ever met put it that way and they stayed with us and we yeah we went into yellowstone national park and in the winter and it was snowing and it was just amazing it was incredible so it can be all the way from making great friends to uh, just having a having an amazing place to stay and to add on to that one more point is i am on warm showers as a host if anybody happens to be touring through near skipton in the yorkshire dales in england more than welcome to hit me up oh and awesome good man yeah, I, I think uh, whilst i'm yeah whilst i'm now static and in one place um i've had one request and it just happened to be a week that i was away myself on a on a trip um so i didn't get to to host them but yeah if if warm showers could m- make their app usable i don't think they have an app at the moment that'd be great <laughs> that's the only go- <laughs> it's the only complaint with the website is is um, and also to be able to search via the last time people were online because there's so many dormant accounts mm. that'd also that'd also be great but uh other than that um yeah th- thank you for creating the website uh, whoever made that website is uh, it's amazing yeah yeah the community who run it uh, are awesome i'm i'm gonna get on it as well yeah if somebody wants to come and stay in erland in uh in sweden then um then come and give us a shout i just kind of forgot about it i was thinking yeah we should do that but we only just ended up finding this place a couple of weeks ago so uh yeah that would be really cool we hosted one in poland um and 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 that was fun it was really fun it's kind of you 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 feel this overwhelming sense of like wanting to help people afterwards you're like please i need to i need to pass this on people have been so amazing so it it feels really nice and i think like it's like you've definitely would have met people for sure but i've met people that are warm showers hosts that have never cycle toured like this is one woman called karen clark who lives on the oregon california border on the coast and she has a 
marijuana farm and she <laughs> makes like these homemade like where it's all legal these homemade cookies and oh god it, it was crazy but she's like um a bit of an a, an older lady um i think she's in her 60s and she loves it just for the company and meeting interesting characters her and her husband jim they are like true stars that are just like yeah i want to just i heard about this thing and i want to meet people that are interesting so rather than traveling she gets people that are traveling to come to her and she gets all these different countries and cultures which if anyone's listening to this and maybe doesn't want to go cycle touring it would be a bit weird listening to this if you're not into bike touring but, but, uh, especially <laughs> but if, if you made you, it this far if you made it this far yeah i <laughs> highly recommend if you're in the place to and you have the means become a host and you might if you you might get some really interesting characters coming through yeah okay couple of bonus points i've got one that i'd like you to tell yeah so bonus tip for cycle touring bike packing hit us adam so i also make youtube videos about my bike touring and my journey oh i knew that was the only reason you wanted to come on promote your youtube (laughs) channel always the same with you (laughs) that's the only reason i've not made a video for months (laughs) um yeah so I I feel my journey. If you search my name, Adam Hugill, you can f- probably find me, hopefully. And whilst I was filming my journey, I had a drone and I managed to go through two different drones. And one of the drone losses, well, actually both of them, to be honest, are quite bad. But one of them's like complete stupidity on my behalf. I, um, I happen to be, happen to be taking a boat from the island I mentioned in Canada, Haida Gwaii, and I was taking the boat on the inside passage, which is on the west coast of Canada, down to Vancouver Island. So I did this thing on the on the ferry ride, which uh, which when you're when you're a foot passenger is actually quite cheap, but to go there normally would cost quite a lot of money. So I was enjoying the whales and all these amazing sea life jumping out of the water, and I had this Mavic Pro two, I think it was drone which was an expensive drone. I'd bought it in Thailand, brand new. And that this is me getting into filming kit. When I said don't get ups, don't get too into <laughs> gear, like I don't really follow my own advice when it came to camera gear. And I thought this super powerful drone that I had, yeah, this will be able to capture some of these these uh, little whales, that are, these gray whales, I say little, they were massive, these gray whales that are next to the boat. So I, I got the drone and set it off just on the back of the the deck and it managed to keep with the the ferry and i think really the reason it was keeping with the ferry is because it's protected from the wind as soon as i pushed that drone out just 10 meters away and the wind caught it (laughs) it just went (laughs) and i'm like oh god and i'm like got it on sport mode as quick as i could and (laughs) flying it back towards the ferry and i was with um, another bike tourer that i happened to meet um, on the ferry his name was Jim he's from the United States and he's uh, just what he's like oh no man you've lost <laughs> I'm like no and I'm flying it so fast like as low to the ground as I can and I think I got it up to 70 kilometers an hour this drone the speed so the ferry was was half going a bit of me was like can we tell the ferry driver to slow down? And I'm like, I'll probably get, I think I'll get arrested for that. So uh, I think it was probably illegal flying it off the ferry in the first place. So there's lesson number one is don't fly drones where you're not meant to. That's actually a serious, there's another side story I've got from this. Um, a good friend of mine um, ended up spending a month in jail because in, in a Myanmar what? prison because he flew his drone above the capital city. Um, so me and my friends don't have a good record of flying drones. He flew his drone in the capital city, and it was um, he was next to the police when he flew it, thinking it was okay. And it just happened to be flying over parliament buildings and government buildings. So I think it's similar to flying it over a military base. So he, they, as he landed it, they arrested him. And he was very lucky to only get a month in, in jail. So he's he's in one of my videos if you ever want to hear about his story <laughs> there's the subtle plug there but uh but yeah 
don't fly a drone off a ferry. I hope he got some seriously good B-roll for that. I mean, you'd want some mega stuff, wouldn't you? For a month in jail. Well, the, the, uh, his name's Arthur. Uh, Arthur in French. He's a Frenchman. But um, Arthur, he when he... When I saw him, I saw him about a month after he'd come out of jail, or not even that, maybe a week after he'd come out of jail. And we cycled through South Korea together. And I asked him what his, because he cycled from Germany to that point in Myanmar. He then, when he got released, the French government managed to get him to be released because he didn't know how long he'd do in jail, in prison. He initially got told, I think you could do six years. And, um, and Myanmar at that time and even now there's a lot that their judicial system is very different to a western system where the judge makes his verdict and that's what will stand and different laws obviously so I managed to get him out he showed full remorse and when I spoke to him afterwards he said and he really meant it he said it's the best experience of his life and I think it's probably he can say that having only done a month there mm. but he said the way that the the prisoners treat him were were really good he said that the government actually treat him really well and um yeah he was, he was he had nothing but praise for the country and he said he didn't want to ever say anything bad about myanmar because he had such a wonderful time there it's um it's almost always a disaster when i fly a drone as well so uh yeah i'm gonna have to publish that video that i keep talking about soon um finding one in the jungle but yeah uh, fly be careful where you're flying drones that's uh that's definitely a good point okay my my bonus is um, never trust a fart in South America. That, that sounds delightful. <laughs> it's some well-earned advice. Uh, well, I'd say Latin America, actually. So we were we were in Mexico, and um, I'd started to feel a little bit under the weather. We'd been eating one dollar tacos, five for a dollar, and I made a video for our kind of vlog, and I was just praising these tacos. And there, there was there, we went to the same spot, and there was quite a few people there during the week, and then we went back on Sunday, nobody in there. And we're just thinking, oh, this is weird. I think it transpires that they use all of the old meat that day, and then they get like a new delivery on the Monday. That's why the locals don't go. So, or, that, or that's what we were later told anyway. Anyway, so uh, I'm making these videos being like, Mexico's amazing, you couldn't get uh, five tacos for dollar back home um this this is just incredible and it still tasted good and then about an hour later i was starting to really pay for it and uh and i was just feeling really really terrible like bad food poisoning so we we were staying with these warm shower hosts in this tiny little apartment in mexico city and they had two little kids and i just felt so bad because i was stinking out their toilet and i just couldn't get off it and uh and it was like their family home but it was just a two like a well kind of a one bed apartment we were sleeping on the sofa and i just didn't want to go back out into the lounge because i knew the mess and the smell that i'd left in there was brutal anyway so that carried on for about the next two months and I just kept thinking that I was getting food poisoning. I kept making all these videos saying, oh, I'm so unlucky. I keep just eating like bad meat. And I'd been to the doctors a few times and there's doctors and then there's doctors. And the places that we were going to were kind of very cheap. They're on a far next to a pharmacy and there's a bloke and he's got a certificate that's probably just printed off and it just says doctor whatever. So I don't really know if they were proper doctors, but they were about four dollars to go to and i thought oh, i was probably not that serious so they'll be able to treat me anyway misdiagnosed misdiagnosed and nobody had given me a blood test and this was probably seven or eight weeks after when i first started getting it and i was really really pale and purple under my eyes but we we just got to oaxaca and there was an amazing off-road route that we wanted to do um, that's on bikepacking.com, but just have to be a bit careful with that because we ran into some Mexican cartel. So that's for another time. But just if you're going to do that route, message me. So, uh, yeah, we, we we were going to do this route and I'd been OK for a couple of days. I was kind of having a few bad days, then OK days. And then we left and we start cycling into the mountains. And I got this message from the doctor and it just said, oh, you've got salmonella in your blood. That's really bad. You need to get to a pharmacy ASAP. And we'd cycled for days into the mountains. Fortunately, we had some people who kind of uh, we managed 
managed to cycle through some mountains, get in the back of a farmer's va- uh, truck, and then had a few other lifts and then managed to get to this place where there was a pharmacy. And uh, finally got this like tripack stuff that's supposed to treat you. And they were saying, oh, you need to be checked for typhoid and all this really serious stuff. And uh, and I was thinking, shit, this is actually quite bad. And I remember we, we were staying in this hostel. And then um, I, I went to the loo at the same time as my girlfriend. And we both came out and uh, we were washing our hands next to each other. And she was just like, oh, are you okay? And I said, yeah, it was just a fart. And I was looking at her in the eyes as I was saying this. So we were about a meter away. And just as I said, it was just a fart. I shat myself and it was <laughs> unbelievable. Like the amount, yes. the, the sheer payload was outrageous in the only pair of boxes that I had left. So now I had one pair of merino boxes and two pair of cycling shorts and I was just going through those and that was my only pair of boxes and I didn't want to buy a new one because it, I wanted like a merino one that would last. And it was just, it was just awful. It was kind of like, uh, I felt like a little bit of me died inside that day. She thought it was hilarious. and well, That's good. It's good that she can see that. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'm sure that's happened to pretty much everyone. But the, the frequency that it happened to me, I would just say maybe never trust really cheap food and also never trust fart in Latin America. So I think that's my, my bonus tip. Adam, thanks so much for coming on. It was awesome. I always love our chats. Yeah, really good, mate. Thank you for having me. And everybody, thanks for listening. You can head over to calltoadventure.uk for show notes. Or if you enjoyed this, um, I've got a 4,000 plus word article on bikepacking, everything I learned from Alaska to Panama. If you want to know more, it covers gear, bikes, route finding, loads of stories when things nearly went pear-shaped and uh, loads, loads more. So, um, yeah, if you like this format, let me know and we'll do a few more of those. So, um, yeah, Adam, thanks again for coming on. If people want to find out a bit more about you, I think you've gone dark on social, but your, your YouTube still up, isn't it? How can people find that stuff? That's it. Yeah. If you look for me, Adam Hugill in YouTube, you'll find me. I've decided to come off uh, social media just for the time being. I uh, find it wasn't doing me a lot of good. So yeah. Well done. Good. Yeah. Good move. And probably the one of the most important things and that's leave no trace when you're wild camping. So be a responsible camper. Don't give everyone else a bad name. But yeah, you can read all about that on some articles on Call to Adventure. I think we've actually got a drinking game now where every single article that I write, I write Leave No Trace. So every time you see it, you you take a drink. Um, get in touch on the gram if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to cover or anyone that you'd like me to co-host with in the future. We're at calltoadventure.uk. That's call to adventure.uk. Or you can email us at info at calltoadventure.uk. Thanks again for listening. Adam, thanks very much. And everybody stay safe. Happy adventures. Look forward to seeing you all again soon. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Head over to Call to Adventure. That's T-O, calltoadventure.uk for show notes and more about this episode. You'll also find lots of other free content there. Things like how-to guides and gear reviews, everything to get you out on your next adventure. We've also got loads of adventures for you to join us on in the UK and abroad. We've got things like climbing, hiking, mountaineering, surfing, wild swimming, ski touring, and we're adding new ones all the time. So do take a peek. Each booking helps us fund our green mission and all international trips are carbon offset. Please do rate and review the show if you're enjoying it. It helps get more people engaged with the outdoors and on board with protecting wild places. Thanks for listening. See you next time.